Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress uh, Oral History Project, so capably uh, done here at our wonderful public library in Cincinnati. Um, I'm going to be interviewing John O'Brien from Cincinnati, World War II veteran, and uh, our very capable camera operator is Dennis Daly of the History Department of our library. Uh, uh, John, uh, where were you born? Covington, Kentucky. Covington, right across the river. Right. How right. about that? Oh. Yeah. We moved out after the 37 flood. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, it, my goodness. It didn't come up to get us, but it was, it was surrounded us, put it that way. <laughs> right, right. Um, tell us about your family. You had brothers, sisters? Uh, I had three older sisters. I was the only boy and the youngest. And, oh, uh, boy. As everybody says, they're always spoiled when you're the youngest boy. Sure. Or the only boy, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> I should say, <laughs> yeah. both of the three older sisters, I'll bet they took well, good care of you. <laughs> it helped. <laughs> Where they were not too uh, feisty, so it wasn't bad. They were yeah, easy good. to get along with. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you were over in uh, in Covington, and uh, tell us about your family, mom, dad. Uh. Dad worked for the railroad. Mom was a stay-at-home mother, mm -hmm. and uh, like I say, after the '37 flood, we moved to Bridgetown, and lived in Bridgetown until such time as the Korean situation started. I had enlisted in the National Guard mm -hmm. uh, about three months prior to being activated. Okay. We were activated on August the 19th of 1950, went straight from here to Fort Lewis, spent almost a year in Fort Lewis, and then after that we were taken over to uh, Germany right outside of Stuttgart at a converted Luftwaffe base, which was a little town called Nelligan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were there for two months and then I was assigned to handle the receipt storage and issue of 2,500 new vehicles, oh changeover boy. vehicles from World War II. Well now, uh, uh, let's go back a little bit. I like to get started with your early life too. Where, where did you go to uh, elementary school? St. Idle Wishes, Gonzaga and Bridgetown. Over in, oh, this is by the time you'd moved over right, to Bridgetown. Right, right, yes. Okay. And then Elder. Elder High. And, yes. <clears throat> uh, of course, there's a great, great tradition about Elder High and the West Side and, and uh, the Pit and the Purple Panthers and all that yeah. sort of thing. Um, in high school, did you have any interests, particular interests, uh, hobbies or clubs or anything like that? I wasn't heavy enough to play sports, so uh, I was in a dramatic club. Oh, good. And after high school, uh, when I gra after I graduated from high school, I should say, uh, thought about going to college, but I didn't until I got released from the service, and I attended Xavier. You got the GI Bill. Right. Right, right. 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 That was a wonderful thing. Well, uh, so you were at, um, you were an elder for four, four years. years. Correct. Four years. When did you get out of high school? 1948. 1948. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, of course, 48. Uh, things were things were interesting. Uh, we were kind of rebuilding our nation right. with the, Correct. the veterans coming back and so forth, and wanting homes and so forth. And, and um, the economy starting to grow back up oh, after yeah. being yeah. depressed during the war because right, everything was right. a war effort. Did you have jobs uh, as a kid? A uh, few, um, mainly you know, like uh, working in a bakery, cleaning the pans and getting those set up <laughs> and carrying the flour up from the basement, uh, the 100 pound bags, right. call, carrying those up from the basement to, so they would have them to use in the mixers and things of that nature so they could have the baking for the following day. Well, that was, a, that was early training, wasn't it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you get to the point where you can almost take two bags up the steps, 200 pound bags. And yeah. that was more than I weighed at the time, so <laughs> <laughs> had to be a little more careful going up the steps so you oh, didn't trip or say, whatever. But you were you were trying to save a trip, and uh, right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's and, uh, uh, now your dad worked for the railroad. What uh, what line did he? The Pullman Company. Oh, he was with the Pullman. Right, correct. Okay. He was uh, in charge of the trains going through here, as far as their air conditioning is concerned, oh, which gee. you know in the. 30s and 40s, that was something that was unusual to have air conditioning, and most of them you opened a window. Right. But some of the uh, Pullman sleepers 
did have air conditioning and they had to make sure they were working properly. Mm -hmm. They were not as advanced as the ones we have now. Oh no, they were working off ice, weren't right. they? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, with, <laughs> with a blower behind it. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, did you have any connection with, with uh, your dad's work? Uh, no, 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 no. You didn't I get was, into that at all? No, by the time he retired, I was just graduating from Elder. Sure, so, sure. But, um, well, now, listen, going to Elder, you must have had some, some uh, interesting classmates, schoolmates there. Any old timers that you recall that uh, spar uh, starred at Elder or that you uh, kind of grew up with? Uh, sports were a little bit separate from us, and uh, we did have a couple uh, fellows we stuck around with or bummed around with, however you want to say it. Sure. And uh, they, I think four of them, went to uh, St. Gregory's Seminary oh, at the time. Nice. And only one of them finished. The other ones decided to come out and get involved in business. Mm -hmm. And one of them's down in Florida. He has his own business. And then there's another one here in town uh, of the four that we used to hang oh, around with. He's got his own business also. Well, that's nice. It's nice to have those old connections, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Keep right. your old friends. Mm -hmm. Now, you say you were involved in dramatics? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you performed on the stage? Yes, I guess. <laughs> well, I don't know how good it was, but I was there. <laughs> so, you were in plays and uh, right. sing and dance and so forth? Well, they let, wouldn't let me sing because they wanted to get the people to come over and see the plays. But anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the, last, the senior year, the last play we were in, um, for some reason or other, I had a, an appendectomy attack while the play was going on. So we finished the play. They took me down to uh, St. Francis, which was on Queen City at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, operated the next day. So I missed the last six weeks of high school. Oh, God. Because in those days, if you remember, you, know, you didn't just go in and ride out of the hospital. You had to stay in there like 10 days oh, yes. for a minor operation like that. Right. And uh, then you go home. You have to stay off your feet as much as possible. Sure. and for your recuperation period. And uh, you know, now a woman has a baby, she's out of the hospital the oh next boy. day and she's on her way home. I know it. <laughs> I know it. The, you look back over those times and you think, my goodness, the comparison between then and now is just amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so you got out of, out of high school and in 48. Right. And uh, were you faced with a draft situation or what? No, I was... Uh, pretty secure as far as they were telling us. You know, we, we had a register, but uh, at the time they were not looking necessarily for our group. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hit a couple of part-time jobs and then I started driving a truck uh, for a neighbor. He had some trucks leased to Wilson Freight at the time. And uh, I was driving there until such time as the uh, uh, Korean situation started. And then uh, we were activated through the National Guard, so. Now, it, did, you, uh, did you get married early or no, after I was, you came back? I had to find somebody that would take me, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to search pretty hard, huh? Right, I went, well, I was transferred up to Canton, Ohio, from here, uh -huh. working for the trucking company. And uh, went to church, saw this girl, went to the restaurant that I knew saw her th that night and I, we started talking and one thing led to another. And um, I was 33 when we got married. Mm -hmm. And we are, well, we live, moved back down here because I emancipated her is what I tell her all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Rather down here from Canton where she had some place. Biggest thing in Canton is the Hall of Fame parade. Yeah. Second biggest thing is burning the dump on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> I keep telling her that all the time. She she doesn't appreciate it, but you no, know. No, I'm another, sure. <laughs> that's another. Well, situation. you know, we in the Southwest Ohio, we we think we got it pretty good down here. Right. It's a great great place and a great life. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Now, um, so you uh, obviously you got married after you got out of the service. Yes. Huh? Mm -hmm. Well, now, okay, so. Uh, you said you were sent to Fort Lewis? Correct. Well, now, what was, where was your first basic training? That was it. That we, was it? We went to Fort Lewis, and then since we were a unit, uh, 
they were going to give us the basic training out there. I see. But in the meantime, I was sent back to Aberdeen Proving Ground for schooling Maryland. for 10 weeks. Okay. Yes. And got to stop here on the way through. And then uh, at around Christmas time when the school ended, or the session ended, I stopped back again for Christmas mm. and on the way back out to Fort Lewis. So. How'd you like the Northwest? Pretty, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, we used to drive, take Sunday rides uh, Major Guckenberger, who was used to be in politics here pretty sure. heavy, uh, he was our uh, major, I don't remember what his exact designation was, exec I would say, mm -hmm. and uh, he used to take us, we'd get a truck on Sunday afternoon, go for rides and stop someplace to eat, you know, just looking at the various places out there that you could really enjoy. Sure, and you, of the, course you saw the beautiful mountains and... Right, you could look out the barracks window and see Mount Rainier. How about that? So uh, it was... Puget it was Sound. Really, it, well, we, we had to drive to get to Puget Sound because we were in Tacoma, mm -hmm. which is right outside of Tacoma where Fort Lewis is located. Right. And uh, it was really nice. Right. And, now after, after, after Fort Lewis, well now, what were you doing at... Uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Studying, or it was schooling for ordnance supply. Oh. And uh, while I was there, not to brag, but the uh, one instructor asked me to, if I wanted to stay and spend the rest of my time at Aberdeen as an instructor. And you know, you're young, you're impressionable, and everything else like that. But he said, no, nah, I think I want to stay with my unit. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Fort Lewis. Mm -hmm. And had I stayed there, you know, I'd have been closer to home and everything else like that, but I still would not have seen what I saw in Germany. Right. So, uh, Now you traveled by train back and forth correct. across the country? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> On the way out, we were the second car behind, I mean, we were the first car, rather, behind the club car. Oh. So when a club car closed, uh, people growing through, and we're in the Pullmans, you know, we're in bunks, and a couple of times, uh, some of the people going through would pull the curtain open just to make sure you were sleeping or, you know, <laughs> give, you, give you a wake up call when the Hello? bar closed. Yeah. <laughs> so much for privacy, yeah. huh? You sure you don't want to get up? No, <laughs> I'm sleeping. <laughs> but uh, anyhow. The, How big a unit did you have? 27 people. 27. Right. And um, when we got out to Fort Lewis, we set up the battalion. We were a de headquarters detachment for a battalion headquarters. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had three companies assigned to us out there that we had to go inspect uh, different times, you know, make sure their records were being held up properly and instructing them on the ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting. Our company, or our detachment commander was a captain. He was going over to Korea and wouldn't know if I wanted to go along with him as his driver. No, I don't think so. <laughs> a little too dangerous for me, so <laughs> I'll go the other way if we got a chance, or I'll just stay here with the unit. Sure. And, uh, well, now, did the whole unit go to Germany? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My goodness, that was very unusual. Well, they, it was just a small detachment, yeah. and uh, apparently they had plans for us, uh, you know, as far as this uh, distribution was concerned. Mm -hmm. And so they, they sent us over there, and we did lose a couple of people because they didn't want to go overseas and opt out of it, and then we picked up replacements for them. And all in all, it worked out very well. Where did you embark from uh, to go across the ocean? Did you leave Out of Jersey, New, New Jersey. Jersey, yeah. yeah. And then we came back to New Jersey on the way back through. What kind of a ship were you on? The one going over was uh, what they considered a luxury liner at the time, but half the people on there were dependents. Uh, some of the wives going over to be with their husbands oh, and their family. And uh, then the other half was where we were. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were restricted naturally from going any other places on the ship because they kept an eye on us pretty closely. Sure. And uh, <laughs> on the way back, we were on what was considered a converted luxury liner there. But, oh, gosh, that was terrible. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as a troop ship, but it wasn't uh, like right. the Queen Mary or something like that. Right. How, how did you like that ocean voyage? Did you have rough waters, or was it pretty smooth? Coming back, or going over, it was fine. Coming back, it was rough. In fact, it sounded like the propellers were coming up out of the water on a couple of different occasions, because oh, yeah. it was a pretty good storm. <laughs> and uh, we were down in the uh, below deck, and I think there were four sergeants 
higher than me at the time, and all four of them were sick. So I wound up being a compartment sergeant. And wow. uh, had to t keep an eye on the guys there, and you know, if anybody got sick. Sure. So we won't go into any of the other details on that because <laughs> It's a little sickening, but... Oh, yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but we got back and uh, took the train home and start, well, I had to stay in the guard for a little bit of time because I signed up for three years initially. So I stayed in there and then uh, signed up with the unit here in town for another three years and uh, made master sergeant. Well, good for you. So, uh, well, that's great. Now, tell us about Germany. How, how did you like Germany? From what I saw of it, it was nice. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were uh, put on alert a couple of different times, you know, where you had to load up everything in the trucks, mm -hmm. gasoline and everything in the trailers, and uh, go up and get on the Autobahn and uh, drive maybe 15 miles. Now, you were there. Let's see. I'm trying to think. You were there, uh, you were there after the Berlin airlift then, weren't you? Just as it was ending, right. Just as it was ending, right, right. yeah. And uh, there were civilians, well, when, like I say, when we got on the Autobahn, there were quite a few civilians running up and down there. And uh, surprisingly, how fast they were going compared to how fast we were going. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> there was a little bit of difference there. Yeah, you know, I can imagine. Yeah, they're pretty wide open over there on that. Whatever level. you can get is what they had. At that time, they were saying, you know, whatever your car will make, that's what your speed limit is. How about that? So, in fact, you driving on there, you look in the mirror and you think it was just a speck on the mirror, and next yeah. thing you know, here comes a Porsche <laughs> right past you. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no, it wasn't bad. We, I had two three-day uh, passes the whole time I was in Germany, the whole year, and because uh, when I was in the distribution situation where we were changing vehicles, um, I wasn't allowed off the base because I, you know, I was working as much as I, we worked Christmas Eve, we worked New Year's Eve, we worked New Year's Day, and uh, issuing, you know, getting all the paperwork together and sure. getting them ready to go, making sure that everything was uh, up to snuff. Well, as, as a clerk now, you had a responsibility for checking uh, materiel? Correct. Trucks and right. cars and right. so forth? Well, it was all uh, Jeeps, three quarters and two and a half, okay. the changeover vehicles from, World War II to what right. they considered the interim, and uh, we won't go into any more details on them. <laughs> some of them were good, some of them weren't, so you know how it is. And well, you know, funny stories, because you know your family is going to see this, you're going to get a DVD of our interview, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, the more you tell, the more people will enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of different times, some of the officers would come in and, you know, we'd be in, the off in our office at night working, getting paperwork together and everything else like that. And they'd walk in and they're expecting you to jump up and shout, you know, yeah. attention and everything else like that. And the most famous statement was, we're off the clock. We're just in here on our own time. Sure. Well, what do you do when an officer comes in? You know, say hello and keep on working. Of course. So uh, they, the one was going to give us a hard way to go one night. So the next morning, we went out and got every vehicle that was just <coughs> under the, the deadline status and get, had, gave them to him. Like if they had a crack in a windshield, we wouldn't replace it. We just gave it to them. Mm -hmm. And then they took it back to their unit and they had to have it replaced. So the next time the guy came in, he was the nicest person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> like, like old friends together and uh, gave a... I was the old corporal at the time, and I gave a captain a direct order one day to get his people off the post, and he wanted to see our battalion commander. So I took him down to show to the battalion commander, and uh, he was going to start, and the battalion commander says, what did he tell you? And the uh, captain says, he ordered me to get off the post, and I'm going to keep my men here so they get a warm meal. Mm -hmm. Cap or the battalion commander says, I think you got about 10 minutes to clear the gate. If you're not, you're going to stay here and your people are going to go. We'll hold you till the MPs get here. Oh my so, it, you know, had the power, didn't want to use it, yeah. but, uh, you know, sometimes you have to pressure people a little yeah, bit to get their, get their attention. So. Well, you know, in those days, you know, John, uh, uh, as doing office work and so forth, long before computers, long oh, yes. before copiers, 
You had a typewriter, right. you had a mimeograph machine, right. Right. that kind of stuff. Right. I took typing at Elder, and I think I passed it with just an actual passing grade. I, you know, it uh -huh. wasn't anything spectacular. 60 words or something. <laughs> yeah. And then when you get over there, you, you're typing a lot of numbers for the vehicles that you're issuing out and uh, increased my speed com uh, completely over uh -huh. what I was doing in high school, cause sure. maybe because I knew it had to be done. Sure. So uh, we I enjoyed typing. I liked I, I liked the actual yeah. Yeah. Well, working of it. And then when I got into transportation, you know, there was a lot of freight bills you had to type, and I was oh, yeah. typing them there. And uh, now, it, at at the base there at Stuttgart, uh, you were uh, supplying the troops that were occupying, right? Right, right. And uh, we were they. Orders would come over from the states naturally, and then Seventh Army would send them down to us, and uh, get you know thirty hypothetically thirty jeeps, maybe uh, five three quarters and five two and a or something along mm -hmm. that line, and all the serial numbers had to be recorded and uh, put onto their orders, the shipping orders that they were getting. Right. And I learned a real quick lesson on inbound that. Uh, made me learn how to spell my name very well and how to write it very well. I was not checking the, I wasn't signing them, I should say, when they came in. I was just putting them in a drawer. G, or the uh, attorney, or inspector general came by one day and asked me about them. So I showed him where he, they were, and he says, uh, they have to be signed. So I went in town the next day and got me a, a facsimile signature made up. Oh, yeah. Stamped them all, he came back a week later and he says, uh-uh, can't do that. It has to be written. Oh, for so I think I had something like 800 or 900 <laughs> documents that had to be signed. <laughs> and like I say, I had writer's cramp, but I learned how to write my name very clearly. <laughs> so, but so much for planning ahead, huh? Right, right. Well, you know, you're, you're only 19 years old or 20, and at the, sure. in those days you weren't exposed to as much business like you are now, or as, sure. um, as much... A computer or anything along, you know, generated right. equipment like that, and uh, didn't know, you know, I yeah. just put it in there and uh, let it go for the time <laughs> being because I was too busy doing the other things, and we'd had to. When the infantry guys came up to uh, pick up vehicles, they always made them travel with their first-class uniforms on, their polished boots and everything mm -hmm. else along that line, and again, where we had the trucks parked, it was muddy. So uh, officers that say, uh, how soon are you going to bring them up? I said, as soon as your people go down and get them. Mm -hmm. They got new boots. I mean, they got their uh, Class A boots on and their Class A uniforms. I said, I'm sorry, but they're going to have to go get them. So uh, they had to go down the mud and get them and bring them back up on a hard surface. <laughs> and uh, didn't go over too well with quite a few of them. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> but what can I say? You know? <laughs> That's what we were limited to. Well, yeah, I should say. Well, you know, uh, and you, you, sh you show it, uh, your experience that you were learning uh, and progressing through the, through the ranks, uh, taking on more responsibilities, and uh, mm -hmm. you, you learned a lot from that, didn't you? Right. It was a very interesting situation. Yeah, I should say so. Had no regrets about the whole thing. You know, right. A lot of people say, ah, oh, I hate the service and all the other things like that, oh, but it, no. it was, like you say, learning experience and uh, it uh, worked out very well. And you met people from all around, right. you know, right. you made right. new friends, right. and uh, it, was a, it really was a, a very broadening experience, yeah. I found it that way myself. Right. Well, we had a tailor on base, and his son used to come down and uh, sit in the barracks, uh, well, our rooms, not barracks, and uh, he spoke quite a bit of English. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, he would tell you where to go in town to get a good meal and where they would allow you to speak English. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them, it's like here now, we're having problems with language. Over there, they would tell you where to go that the people would uh, tell you what they had right. as far as the menu is concerned. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it was a little hard to learn German that quick, especially... Oh, yeah. Being, a, I had trouble with English, let alone with German. <laughs> <laughs> now you you come from an Irish background, don't you? Right. My mother was a McDermott. My father's an O'Brien. Oh my gosh. And uh, you can't get any more. They were over in the. They lived over here in the West. Well, where Queensgate is right now, you can't say West End anymore. I know. It's Queensgate. You know. So changed. Right. It? Yeah. And uh, Dad always said that years when he was growing up, 
that they had a German church and an Irish church over there. And to go to confession, if you couldn't make it to the Irish church, you go to the German. But you'd meet somebody outside and they'd tell you what to go in and say. <laughs> you didn't know what you were confessing at the no. time. So <laughs> he said when he came out, he wasn't sure what he said. So, but <laughs> they gave him absolution anyhow. So, so. <laughs> again, uh, you know, that's part of the learning experience that you went through. <laughs> oh, golly. Well, now, did you find, um, did you have much contact with the German people aside from just going to a restaurant or something? Not like really. We were, uh, How about, did you go to church off base or anything no. like well, that? Well, we did for Christmas, or, yeah, Christmas Eve, midnight mass, and the church we went to had no heat. No heat. It, they still had not had gotten their heat uh, put back up after World War, yeah. after the World War, I say. And, uh, it was quite interesting that, you know, you go in there and the uh, place was packed. Yep. And the singing would almost raise the roof off the church oh, because yeah. everybody was so happy that, you know, oh. they, were, they weren't at war, they were coming out of it, and it was, you know, more freedom for them. Right. That they could uh, go to church without worrying about anything. So. Well, and you know, it was so interesting because we had defeated Germany but now we were helping build back their country. Correct. Mm -hmm. Which we have always done through our history. Oh, yeah. yeah. The greatest, the greatest nation in the world. Right. And, uh, so compassionate and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, was the attitude of the German people pretty friendly toward you? Most of the time, yes, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. That the, uh, the only thing, you know, again, the language barrier, uh, if you're trying to tell them something and you don't get it across very well, you know, then you got a little bit of a problem trying to explain it more to them. And uh, hopefully, or thankfully rather, you'd find somebody in the crowd that, when you're out directing traffic that understood a little bit of English. Because <laughs> we had to block the road one night because a tank transporter was coming in and it was just a little small two lane road. So we were trying to explain to people what was coming in, and finally this one guy, uh, like I say, he spoke broken English and uh, came up and said that, you know, he was telling these people what we were telling them. And uh, we got along, you know, no problem from there. But uh, they were turning the tank transporter around on the Autobahn one day, and a guy buried a Porsche underneath it. Oh boy. Now those things are only like, They're you know how off, so high low, off the ground, yeah. yeah. And he was flying up through there, and they were turning it around. And he, I don't know if he didn't see it, he couldn't stop or whatever, but he buried it right underneath there, up oh. to the uh, windshield. Oh, geez. So that was yeah. a little yeah. tough. Yeah, that's pretty bad, I should say. Um, you know, the equipment that you had, you talk about uh, the Jeeps and, uh, and uh, did you have four by fours and all that right. sort of thing? Right. Well, uh, the two and a halfs we were getting in, the trucks we were getting in, uh, they had what they called, they were put out by Rio Trucking at the time. Oh, yeah. And they had what they called a overriding uh, six wheel. And when you would get in mud and the back wheels would start slipping or anything like snow or anything, the front wheels were supposed to pick that up mm -hmm. and start pulling. And they did not do a good job on that. That's why they were sending them over to Germany taking the World War II vehicles over to Korea oh. because World War II vehicles would hold up better with that terrain over in Korea. Right. And so we uh, got stuck with them issuing them out over there until uh, GM came along a few years later and brought out their trucks. And they were, they were doing a lot better job than the, the, <laughs> whoever designed the Rios. You know, I don't know if it was the military that designed them or Rio presented it to the military and they said, oh, okay, this sounds like a good idea. Yeah. But it, it wasn't, wasn't thought out very quickly, let's right. put it that way. And I guess Rio's no longer in business. No, no. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's that, well, a, and that's a name that uh, younger generations uh, are pretty unfamiliar, unfamiliar with. Yeah. When you mention Rio now, they think it's the uh, rock and roll band or whatever it was. Yeah, the, uh, right. Know, REO, REO Speedwagon. whatever, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> You're not pronouncing it right, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a nice voice. Did you, uh, did you sing? Did you do any musical uh, not to amount to anything. Work or anything like <clears throat> that? Excuse me, in the shower, basically. In the shower. <laughs> 
shower in church and then I sing loud enough in church that everybody you know, wants to move away a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, being in an occupation uh, situation like that, uh, what, what did you have for entertainment on the base? Uh, did you have a, like we had a, a USO or something? Or? No, we had a, a day room above the mess hall and it was one of the separated buildings that we really had to go outside to go to get to it. it took about 100 feet from mm -hmm. one building to the other. But it was, at that time, very well equipped. They had ping, ping pong, they had pool tables, and um, they would have movies like maybe five nights a week or something along oh, yeah. that line. And naturally, they were the older movies that sure. uh, they'd start playing, and then halfway through, they'd stop or, you know, they'd have problems with the tape running through, I mean, the film running through the machine without recording anything. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, you just sat there and chewed on your popcorn until they Why finally sure. got it back to where it belonged. Why sure. But, yeah, that was all part of the, uh, kind of part of the atmosphere. We probably didn't uh, appreciate it at the time, but as you look back on it, it was, it was, uh, it, it was very, very pleasant, very fun. fun. Yeah. And of course, those old movies, the old black and white right. movies. And, right. And, but uh, that we were accustomed to it. You know, course. we didn't, about that time, the televisions were just starting out. And uh, we, movies in color were, like you say, quite limited. Right. And uh, so, you know, again, it was just whatever you had to put up with. Why, well, sure, so. absolutely. Well, that, you know, that, uh, again, Johnny, that, that was part of your, uh, your life formation right. to uh, having all these different experiences and uh, do you keep in touch with any of your outfit uh, these days do you have reunions or anything like that uh, no they haven't had a reunion and <clears throat> excuse me I don't remember how long but uh, one fellow that I uh, well we went to grade school together I still get, see him quite often but uh, other than that uh, yeah. Some of the other ones are around, but as years go by, they're getting fewer and fewer. Oh boy! As you well know, with your group. Well, yeah, I should say, you know, there. Uh, it's about uh, about a thousand six hundred a week now mm -hmm. of World War II veterans. Are One of them just passed away down in Lawrenceburg, and he was over for the D-Day celebration. Uh, what was it? The 60th anniversary, I believe it was. Anyhow, he was the one who placed the wreath oh. uh, when they had the celebration going on over there. Sure. And uh, he just passed away about four months ago. Yeah. He was 83, I believe it was, okay. 85, somewhere in that neighborhood, driving a truck every day, mm -hmm. a semi. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. really, you know, hard worker. He didn't, didn't really need the money, but he was... Act, he wanted to be, stay active. Yes. So that's why he uh, decided, you know, he had worked for the company for over 50 years. Sure. And so he just, you know, decided to keep Well, you know, going. and as, as, as you and I have found out, it's, uh, it's best to keep active as much as sure. you possibly can. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. I, well, after I retired the first time, uh, I was delivering flowers and then uh, started delivering home health care medication called back to the companies and um, worked there two years till I got the new person trained, left, went out and got another part-time job. They called me back for the third time. <laughs> so I told them, I said, you know, come on, it's getting a little bit old here, that, so uh, I think I'll just stay home the next time. And uh, so far they haven't called me back, thankfully. But as far as part-time jobs are concerned, uh, never had any problem finding one. Right, In fact, I'm right. working right now. Yeah. Or I've got a part-time job right now. Sure. And, absolutely. Uh, so you're, you're what, 78? I'll be 78 the uh, 27th of this month. Well, oh, congratulations. Thank That's you. That's wonderful. You look great. Mm, thank um, you. Yeah, when I came out of the service, like I was saying, I could, couldn't push my stomach out, but now I can't push it back in. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, Things like that change. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad but, manners, it's just good food. So that fills you up. <laughs> so now, going back to your, your active service, um, you were in Germany in, in what, 1950? 51 and 52. 51 and 52. Right. Okay. And, you know, and those, 
as you read history, those were very interesting times. People think, oh, you know, there's no war going on. It's mm -hmm. kind of dull. But there was so much uh, animosity, uh, animosity to, and yeah. political right. maneuvering, and right. the Russians, the Soviets were mm -hmm. were getting stronger and stronger. Did you have any contact at all, or did you feel any pressure from the east? No, we were far enough over that it didn't bother us. Yeah, right. But right. I had to go up to Seventh Army headquarters one time, and that was getting a little bit further over, and you know you could tell. They had more people there on guard duty and sure. things of that nature, and uh, then went back to my bar sure. I mean, my unit after that. And, and of course, uh, at that time, Berlin was a divided city. Correct, and they had the air. Part of the airlift was still going on, but they mm -hmm. were getting them. By the time we got there, they were getting them fairly well stocked. Right. And uh, that was a them remarkable out. thing. Yes, it was. Absolutely. Yeah. And we just celebrated mm -hmm. the 60th anniversary of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, at the time you didn't think it was anything really major, but uh, when you look back on it, it was. Well, it yeah. was yeah. because it it you know it really it really stemmed uh, you might say the Soviet political advance right. Right. Uh, toward the West. Um, did you get into any other countries like France or anything like that? Got into Switzerland. Uh, on the two three day passes that I had, oh yeah, and uh, that was as far as we got because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I say, wasn't because I was good. It was because of the job, and we were working so many hours trying to get all these vehicles issued out in the period of time that we were allotted. And so we, if we did go off the base, it would probably be into Stuttgart and then come back at sure. You know, you're only out maybe four hours or something like that. Right. But uh, and that would be on a Sunday evening. So. Well, now, when did you get your uh, Master Sergeant stripes? Here in the... Uh, in the National Guard? Yes, when oh, I came I back. See. and okay. uh, well, I got you. Wound up being a field first, is yeah. what they considered it, which was... Right. I wasn't confined to the administration. I was out working with the uh, troops mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, taking them for test drives and things like that, showing them supply uh, items, and... Uh, Given them PT. Mm -hmm. was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Grind. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, we went to summer camp a couple different times. Where did you go? One was down at Fort Campbell, one was at um, Fort Knox, and the other one was up in Michigan around Grayling. Oh, yeah. So we, we, somehow or other, we got put on guard duty down at Fort Knox right by the mint, I mean by the vault where the money stored, really? yeah. And uh, that was when we were on a two week summer trip. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you know, it, it, it worked out pretty decent. You know, yeah. It wasn't yeah. really a big pressure situation. Now when uh, did you get married? 1964. 64. 8, 8, 64, it was a square root year, right. if you're a mathematician. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I can. We can handle that. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we just celebrated our 44th this year. Wonderful. And Congratulations. God, all the scars that I have from it. But it, No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, uh, was, when I was working here in Cincinnati for a transportation company, I got transferred to Canton to take over the terminal up there and went to church one Sunday morning, saw this girl saw the hat. Uh, for some reason or other, her hat stuck in my mind. Went back to the uh, diner that evening to get something to eat. And uh, she was there, and you know, we started talking. One thing led to another. And in June, she graduated from college from Kent State. And she wanted a bridge job until fall, you know, until she started mm -hmm. teaching school. So one thing led to another, so I hired her. And uh, that was in 1963. Mm -hmm. And uh, every weekend after that, either she was down here or I was up there. So we finally decided we better get married because it was getting expensive. So <laughs> little did you know how, much, how expensive it can yeah, get. Yeah, <laughs> right. That was only the beginning, huh? <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> Tell her it was cheaper to go, keep going drive. Well, at that time, gas wasn't that bad, so you could keep driving back and forth. Well, did she finally uh, adjust pretty well to southern Ohio? Oh, yeah, yes. 
Yeah. Uh, Found it to be a pretty good place. Right. She started her master's in library science up there, and then she finished it over here at NKU after oh. we moved down here. Well, she's a librarian. And, right. She's with the system here. Oh, she is. Yeah. She's been here 20, I think, 21 years. You know <coughs> Mrs. O'Brien? No, no. Well, that's she, interesting. She's out at North Regional. Oh. Uh, they put her by the police barracks where they could keep an eye on her. <laughs> like, that's what I keep telling her all the time. But she, <laughs> she says, mind your own business. Or so, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, you after, know. <laughs> after 44 years, you know, when, she's when, getting when, used to it. <laughs> and if you're not Irish, you know, it takes you a little while to adjust to the Irish right. uh, sense of humor right. and so forth. <laughs> there, there's another statement they make in here about people living on the west side, you know, the, the, oh, yeah. their origin. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting thing, of course, and I, not being a native Cincinnatian, found it to be a case of, you know, Cincinnati, there's the west side and the east side, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, rarely does the uh, connection... Uh, well, there's an invisible wall up and down Vine Street. Vine Street. Vine Street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. Oh. But, uh, of course, you remember the days of the old West End when the beautiful houses over right. there and so right. forth. Right. And there was a lot of architecture over there. Yeah. And yeah. People were making money selling uh, the items that came out of those places also. Wow. You know, yeah, that was, uh, that, that was a very, uh, very tough time. Uh, very difficult to see that uh, destruction of that beautiful part of town. Mm -hmm. And it was compact yes. also, you know, because you had quite a few streets in there and quite a few of the families that were of ethnic origin. Yes. And, uh, you know, they had the Irish, they had the, the Italian, the Germans, and uh, any other sure. nationality that was in sure. there at the time. And most of them stayed fairly well in their own. So, uh, you know, never had any trouble or anything. I right. know, in those days, and, and, and there was kind of a feeling of, of support right. in right. neighborhoods, yeah. uh, supporting each other, and, uh, and uh, uh, friendly neighbors, and so forth and so on. Well, John, uh, how about your family today? What, tell us about your family. I have four children. The oldest is uh, son, uh, John Peter. He's married. He lives out in Batavia. Um, Oldest daughter is Patricia. She's living up in uh, Livonia, Michigan. Oh, yeah. She was working for Ford over at Dearborn at uh, transmission calibration. And she took a uh, semi-retirement so she can raise her children uh, to the point where you know, they're, back in, they're both in school. And the third one is another girl. She uh, is an engineer also. She's up at Belcan Engineering. Wow. up in Blue Ash, and the youngest one is uh, a male, it's Paul, and uh, he was involved in golf. He was superintendent of a golf course over here in, uh, on the west side. Oh. A superintendent of maintenance, I should say. Paul O'Brien, yeah, right. sure. And then, I don't know if I mentioned the third girl's name, but it was Peggy. So, and then she has two girls, uh, Layton, and, which is the younger one, Rose is the older one. The oldest son has two sons, uh, Patrick and Nicholas. The one up in Michigan has a girl and a boy, uh, Andrew and Anna. And then the youngest, Paul, has one girl, uh, Riley. Boy, so you've got... Uh, Seven altogether. You've got O'Brien's uh, continuing in the line. Yes. Yeah. So that, far. That's so, very, yeah. very nice. That's very nice. Well, it's just, uh, it's wonderful to learn about you and uh, about your contribution to our nation. And it's very, very important. And it's important for people to know about that. And that's why we, why we do these interviews. And uh, I know that your family is going to enjoy uh, seeing you in action and hearing your voice. And, and that's something that will be forever because uh, a copy of this will go to the Library of Congress archives in Washington, mm -hmm. and a copy is kept here at the Public Library of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So uh, forever and, and ever, uh, people will be able to uh, log in and find out about John O'Brien. And you don't want me to sing to end this 
Sure. So no. <laughs> <laughs> we need anything. <laughs> we welcome all kinds of no. <laughs> contributions. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> I love your sense of humor. But the, uh, uh, you have seen, of course, uh, over the period of your long life, uh, you've seen many, many changes. Uh, not only uh, not only in the military, but also, of course, here in peacetime, and uh, this beautiful city of Cincinnati. And uh, you got any reflections uh, on your life? Uh, anything that you uh, would like to tell us about? Any uh, uh, funny stories, uh, school days, or anything else like that? Except for uh, not getting sick. I have accidents, and uh, you're accident prone. Yes. <laughs> well, I showed you the, the knee before. The this shoulder. knee is bad. Both shoulders are bad. <laughs> it, he, operation on the head. Uh, now, that was from a fall, right? Right. On painting the pillars on a two-story colonial we were building up in Maslin, and I was up about 12 feet, and the ladder went straight down, or slid down the pillar, and uh, mm. I guess probably I froze. Yeah. not to get off of it in time, because I've had ladders slip out from, um, from me before, and I'd step off of them in time, sure. and uh, no problem there, but this time, for some unknown reason, wow. and uh, my wife had just walked away to go get in the car to go find the rest of the family, because my sisters were visiting up there, and uh, she heard the crash, mm. turned around, and saw me laying there, so she tried to get me in the one sedan we had and couldn't get in there, so she got me in the back end of our station wagon and took me over to the hospital. And I was given my vital statistics, and then they finally saw blood secreting from the forehead. And the next day, uh, which was Memorial Day of 74, is when they did the operation. Oh my goodness. So I was in a coma for 10 days, intensive care for two weeks, and in the hospital five weeks altogether. Good and I finally checked myself out, which my wife wasn't happy with, but anyhow, yeah. <clears throat> that's another story, too. You felt <laughs> enough's enough, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the worst part of it was, like I say, it was a two-story colonial, so the bedrooms were all up on the upper floor. Sure. So you had to sit down and do one step at a time going up in the mm -hmm. same way coming down until this thing, the knee got a little better shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, the oldest daughter came to see me in the hospital, and they had given me a shot of penicillin, which I'm allergic to. Oh, and the, <laughs> the head swelled up like a, a frog. Oh, my and she God. Says, That's not my daddy. So, <laughs> oh. But uh, anyhow, she, uh, after a while, she finally realized it was her daddy. But uh, <laughs> it was a little nip and tuck, they said, because, uh, you know, being in the condition that I was in, uh, the wife showed up one day to visit. The room was empty. No bed, no nothing. And uh, she didn't know what had happened, where I was, or anything else like that, until mm -hmm. she found a nurse. And asked the nurse where uh, I was. I had, a, had had a relapse, and they took me back down to uh, intensive care for a day or two, and then brought me back up again. And uh, there again, that's the old days when intensive care was 10 minutes of an hour at the most. Wow. That they could, you know, you could have visitors. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyhow. It, we were trying to move, well, she moved while I was in the hospital, and uh, it took her quite a bit of stamina to do it. Oh, I should say so, so my goodness. Especially, she had three, well, we had three children at the time, and the youngest was right around two, and two, four, and eight. Mm -hmm. Plus, like I say, moving from getting the furniture out of the storage, and uh, having it brought over to the house and uh, getting all the stuff moved out of the duplex that we were living in at the time. So uh, she, she did a pretty good job. Got to give her credit for well, that. Well, I should say so. so. You're very fortunate to have such a fine woman. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> 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 I, I shouldn't pick on her like that, but I, I do it at home so I can do it uh, outside, you know. <laughs> Well, you, you, uh, it seems to me that you have uh, uh, pretty good mechanical ability. Try to, yes. Figure out things, and you've been able to work on machinery and things right. like that. Yeah. Uh, in, in the service, going back to that, did you have uh, 
a lot of exposure to, uh, to firearms, uh, to armament and that sort of thing? We at Aberdeen, they taught us how to go all the way down into a weapon, a handheld weapon, right. like your rifle or your sidearm, whichever. And uh, anybody else was uh, restricted to how far they could go into them. But when we got out of training down there, we could go all the way into the pistol uh, action, which, you know, if you wanted to hair a trigger, you could go in and hit, scare it down a little bit with a, a file yeah. and uh, make it a little bit more quick right. as far as the uh, discharge of the uh, ammunition. And uh, mainly what they were showing us at every, I mean, yeah, the proving ground was uh, storing items and the equipment that you would use to store those items in the various locations to make it more accessible when somebody wanted to get, if they came in looking for something, sure. that they would have an idea where to look for it. Sure. So, uh, and then driving a the truck, you, uh, when you start loading a truck, you sort of keep the stuff together so that you can get it off easier or mm -hmm. it will ride better. And, uh, cause you don't want to be riding down the road and, uh, something slip, you turn over and kill yourself. Gosh, no, I so. should say. Uh, what about, uh, what about uh, security over there uh, in Germany? Um, we, you had to be pretty watchful? Not, we only had one road in and out of the place, the main road, and uh, we wound up taking turns, or being assigned, I should say, because uh, with the rank, I was sergeant of the guard when I got uh, put on it. And one night, car coming in, and uh, he was driving fairly fast. So I went out, held up my hand, didn't look like he was going to stop. Took the 45 out of the holster and held it up sideways so they could see it. Still didn't slow him down. So I was drawing it down. I didn't know if I was going to shoot him or shoot the cow over in the field. But <laughs> <laughs> when he saw me drawing the, the weapon down, he slowed down. And here was a guy from the uh, locale that had been out with the uh, uh, battalion commander. Oh my gosh. And uh, if I'd have shot him, <laughs> which one I would have gotten, I don't really know. But anyhow, uh, they finally stopped and he, you know, he identified himself so uh, could let him go ahead in. But uh, that was the only problem I ever had on guard duty there I'll because be most of them, you know, you just go out and they, they would stop and talk to you and go on. Sure. Because the people that were working on the base, uh, I guess the prerequisite there was they had to be speak, uh, had to have some knowledge or uh, ability to speak English, English so that they could get their point across. And one other thing with the, we had hardwood floors in our barracks. Hmm. So uh, we, the, what they called the putzfrauls, the cleaning ladies, they would come in on Friday night and scrub our floors with uh, steel wool. So you get the black marks off from your boots and everything else like My that. Goodness. And after about two months, we had to stop doing it because we were messing their economy. By us paying these putz routes, they were making more just cleaning up our barracks rooms than they were the whole week that they were working oh. for the government. So uh, the government wasn't too happy about that part because it was, again, it was like here, it's non-taxable. If you right. pay me something for doing a job for you and it's not reported to the IRS, the same way over there. They, were, they had, had theirs reported to the uh, local authorities. Right. So uh, they just went from there. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Well, the, uh, the uh, interesting th situation uh, with you, of course, is your, your vast, vast experience in life and everything. And, uh, You've been able to impart that to your children. Tried to, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you feel pretty good about that, of right. course. Right, right. And now your grandchildren, my golly, little boys and girls. And right. That, that's just terrific. You get to see them pretty often? Two days a week, I pick up the two granddaughters that are here in town, um, take them out for a little snack after school, mm -hmm. and then take them up to their, uh, where their mother works, up mm -hmm. in Blue Ash, drop them off up there, and then she takes them home and she I come back them. to the house. She's but uh, that includes stopping at like UDF oh, or uh, Chuck E. Cheese <laughs> or Sharon Woods. They like to go to Sharon Woods because they have a, an indoor uh, area that they can play on. 
Oh, yes. And uh, it's very convenient because pick them up in Glendale, just go right on across over course, to the Reading Road. And they, they enjoy it, so, uh, yeah. And well, that's wonderful. You're very fortunate to, to be able to do that, uh, have that much of a family here that you can have contact with. Well, you know, um, as we've said before, this uh, recording of you and your life and your personality comes through so wonderfully, and uh, uh, it is, uh, it's just been a, not only a pleasure, but an honor to be acquainted with you now. Well, and, thank you. Uh, I know that uh, everybody in your family will enjoy seeing this. You're going to have to have a big reunion and get everybody together. And we can sell popcorn. Yeah. While they're watching it. <laughs> <laughs> you put salt and butter on it. <laughs> right. That's the only way to eat it, isn't it? <laughs> Even with my diabetic situation. <laughs> that's the only way to go. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to die, you might as well die with a smile on your face. What the Absolutely. heck? You know? uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Life's, life's too short. <laughs> right. If you keep restricting yourself to what you can do, my gosh. You know, <laughs> it's well, a you know, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a grateful nation. Uh, that thanks you for your service and and your contribution uh, to our nation and its uh, its uh, richness in history and security and everything means a tremendous amount and uh, we thank you very much for that. Oh, thank uh, you. John, it's, uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, thank I hope you, sir. Paths cross again and uh, God bless. Oh, thank you. Appreciate there it. There we are.